Welcome to the Invincible. We're going to be spoiling this game, so if that's going to bother you, you should leave. If you just want my opinion, my review, I think you should play the game, but if you flinch at the price, you should wait until it goes on sale. You will greatly enjoy the game for as long as you enjoy it, and then you will stop enjoying it, and you should stop playing it. Now on with the spoilery stuff. So, this game uses a number of techniques that most games do not use. I would call them editing techniques. You might classify them as writing techniques. It depends on your point of view. These are techniques related to pulse and rhythm. These are things that we don't normally see in games because games do not have a pulse and a rhythm, not at a story scale. <coughs> Sorry, I got a, a little bit of a sinus thing going, so... The problem is that you can't tell how much time is passing between scene A and scene B. In a book or a movie, scene A happens, specific things happen, scene B happens. But in a game, scene A happens and then the player does whatever the heck they want for however long they want and then scene B happens. How can you have a pulse? How can you have a rhythm when the player might take 10 minutes or 2 hours? They might go off and do scene C. They might change into a chicken suit. They might stop playing for 2 weeks. They might be streaming. It's really, really difficult to do anything related to a rhythm when you can't control the rhythm. But this game uses some of those techniques, and they do work out just fine. Also, this game fails to use those techniques, and it falls on its ass several times. And that's really what I want to talk about. I think that we can learn a little bit about using these techniques in games by studying how they were used here in The Invincible. There are a couple of things that we're going to want to discuss, though, uh, in order to lay the groundwork. There are three forces, writing forces, acting on this game. I'm going to kind of assign them people, even though I think that there is actually like a conglomerate, lots of drift between groups and stuff like that. But there are three core forces, one of which is the original story. 1965, Guy wrote a book about robots that could evolve over millions of years, just like life forms. It was a cool idea back then kind of a Star Trek plot, and that definitely comes up in this game a lot. In theory, it's what the game is about. There are clearly people who are on the modern team that want the game to be about that. But then we've also got the modern writer who wanted this game to be about this lady who got stuck on this planet and is trying to save everybody on her way off. I honestly think the premise is surprisingly weak in, in terms of theme, which we'll get to, but it's executed really well. So there are clearly at least a couple of writers involved in that aspect of, of the game, wanting that to be the main point of the game. Then we got the marketing team. I'm just going to call them the marketer for ease of, of definition here. Uh, the marketer would like the game to sell, uh, so he wants to appeal to a demographic. Please appeal to some demographics, please, so the game will actually sell and we will be able to keep our doors open what a monster, right? So these three forces really conflict. They want the game to be dragged in different directions. And this is a big problem. It's a bigger problem in this game than most, because this game has those other two factions. Most games don't. Most games are, you got the writer, and then the marketer says, you need to do this, and the writer says, I guess I'll try and make that work, and that's it, right? But in this game, both of the writer teams, the original, the ones, in, the ones that like the original and the ones that like the modern stuff, they both have a ton of power. They both drive a lot of what happens in this game, which makes it super obvious when the marketing comes in and destroys it. The most basic and obvious example is that the marketing kept me from buying this game for a very long time. I had to have it pitched to me repeatedly by friends. Uh, yeah. The game is marketed as a branching path movie where you branching path your branching paths. Did you know that your choices matter in this branching path movie about branching paths? I don't know how commonly understood this is, but branching paths really limit your core story. They weaken your, your writing limits. You can't go as high. And the reason for that is because, as a writer, your job is to tell your story in the most powerful way you can. If there's a branching path, that means that both branches should be the same strength of story, which means that those branching paths can't affect the story, which means either those branching paths have to be completely off in nowhere land, or the story has to be so basic 
that it doesn't matter what happens there. A good example of this would be Mass Effect, right? You can choose whether to be a Paragon or a Renegade, but the core story just goes the same way all the time, no matter what. The core story does not care what you do or who you are, and that means that you can't really be deeply tied into the core story. Which color you choose at the end of the game feels completely pointless because it is completely pointless. Nothing you did in the game was tied to it in any way. But that doesn't mean that those choices were bad ideas. The core thrust of Mass Effect isn't the underlying story about the Reapers, it's getting along with your buddies, it's having adventures with friends and meeting new people and going new places. So those choices help to pull you into that reality. Getting to choose how brusque you want to be, who you want to be friends with, all of that stuff, that really helps you to invest yourself into the ongoing day-to-day -day adventure of this motley crew, even though it completely destroys the power of the underlying story. The underlying story can no longer tell a story about a captain that is a paragon or is a renegade because you could be either one. This is especially obvious in those multiple choice movie games that we often see. They're almost always extremely poorly written on purpose. They're just spectacle movies, right? So your writing is very base level. Oh look, yetis are here. Oh look, there's demons here. Oh no. And the choices that the player makes in those movies are mostly about the experience of moving through those funny threats um, in whatever way they please. So again, you're getting that investment into the moment-to-moment -moment hangout rather than a really polished underlying core story. But this is a sci-fi walking sim. A polished underlying core story is literally the priority. Or at least it should be. And I'm sad to say that my reservations were correct. All of the branching path stuff in this game severely weakens the game. Some of it is reasonably well hidden. For example, you can fail to find a fish, which is technically a branching path, uh, or you can choose you know, whether to do thing A and thing B, and it's technically a branching path. But it always feels really obvious that the story has to desperately try to figure a way to get that to work. It always feels desperate, like they're clawing at getting the story back. Oh, we have to give the player a choice? Well, fuck! Now my story's completely screwed up. The most obvious example of that is there is a story beat in this game where you're going after one of your friends, and he went rappelling down a cliff. So you go rappelling down a cliff on his rope. You reach the end of the rope, and oh, the end of the rope came way too soon. You fall off, you land on the ground, and now you're stuck down there until you find your friend. You can't get back to base camp. It's a pretty typical writing beat, right? Raise the stakes. You're now stuck. Uh, you've got to find your friend. You want to rescue him. There's no way back up. Got to, got to go. But at some point, marketing dude came along and said, we should just make that a branching choice. So what actually happens in this game is you rappel down the rope. You come to the end of the rope and you don't fall off. Instead, you just stop at the end of the rope and think about what you're going to do next. And it's a branching path where you can choose which way to jump off of the rope. And you're like, oh, well, I can't think of any other way off of this rope. I've got to jump. There's just no other possible options on this rope. Just climb the freaking rope. You've been climbing cliffs all day. You've been carrying corpses up cliffs all day. You can climb a rope. And it's never even brought up. And in my mind, the reason that it's never brought up is because it was originally written as the rope ended and you didn't stop. You just fell straight off. That was in the original draft. That was That's what I'm saying. Obviously, I'm just sort of imagining that. But I can't imagine the writer writing... Seriously, this sort of game where you've been doing all sorts of things absolutely perfectly, just fine, like a competent person, and then forgetting the fact that you might have the audacity to climb a rope. No, it feels like it was crammed in at the last second. And every choice is like that. Oh, do you go over here to this place, or do you go over here to this place? Oh, did you choose that one? Well, screw you, it doesn't work, and you go the other way. Oh, yeah, thanks. Great branching paths, assholes. 
So yeah, branching paths are a marketing technique at this point. People like to say that their game has branching paths because players have been taught that that's somehow good, but it severely damages the underlying writing in every game it shows up in, including this one. Some games can work that out, like Mass Effect, uh, just by changing the focus, but this game really can't, and it severely damages this game. We also see a lot of that marketing prose coming into play when we see writing that doesn't fit into the flow of the game. Because that current day writer, the one that actually came up with this story, is incredibly deft. Just shockingly good at their job. I really love this person. Uh, their writing is top notch. This sort of thing uh, comes up a lot where they will start to use this pulse technique, this rhythmic technique that you normally see in movies and comics, but not in games. Uh, as an example, when you start this game, you have severe brain fog for some reason, and you are trying to get across the, the desert to get to your camp, and you can't contact anybody. You're all alone. So in order to focus, you hum to yourself, and occasionally you say a couple words of the song, right? And it's just a song from your childhood, a lullaby that your parents used to sing, presumably. And it's never brought up. It's never made the thing. They don't go into detail about what the song is or, oh, you were a singer once and then you decided that... No, 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 no. It's just a little pacing tool to sell the fact that you are alone and you are trying to get through and you are focusing by calling up that rhythm from your childhood. Works fantastic. And then you get in contact with the bass, so you stop singing to yourself. But later in the game, you lose contact with bass, you get lost again, and I'm thinking, oh, this would be a good time to bring up the song. And then you start singing again. Once again, you're focusing. This time you get a lot more of the lyrics, a lot more lyrics, a lot less humming, the opposite of the first time. And so you get that rhythm. It's a simple callback, right? But the thing about this is a lot of people, when they see a callback in games, the callback is intended to be like, oh, look at that, <laughs> callback. But this isn't like that at all. It's a rhythmic thing. It's a callback because it makes the pulse stronger, not as a sort of, I want to impress the player. This isn't something put into the game to impress the player. It's there to tell the player what's going on in a more powerful way. You learn a lot about the character by how she adapts to being alone and focused and having brain fog and trying to figure out what to do next. And that's an amazing work. I mean, it's, it, it'd be considered normal in a movie, but here in a game, that never happens. In a game, if there's a callback, it's a, whoa, are you impressed? I remember to do a callback. Another uh, example would be, um, when you start the game, the opening sequence is about how your captain broke his leg, which seems like a strange opening sequence. And then in every scene after that, wherever the captain shows up, you can see his cane in every sequence. Like if you're getting a briefing around the table, then you're all seated, but the, go the one guy with the broken leg is hobbling around with his cane. Are you on the radio? Well, guess what? The radio shot of the captain is a little bit longer than you might expect, just so that you can see the top of his cane in the corner of the screen. They don't make a big deal out of it. They almost never bring up the fact that the captain broke his leg. I think they only bring it up once at the very beginning of the game and once when someone asks if he's still in pain. And that's it, right? But there's that rhythm, that pulse. The captain has a cane. The captain has a cane. The captain has a cane. Over and over and over. It's never surface level, so it never gets noticed. It never gets called out. It never feels repetitive. It's just a framing element. It's just something that you put in as a pulse. And that doesn't happen in other games, not very often. If there's something like that, we strictly stick to the rule of threes. Introduce it, remind them, pay it off. Not simmer, 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 simmer. But that simmering is so good. That's how you make stew. I want to know why the captain's cane is so important. What are they, where are they going with this? What's going to happen? I had a whole bunch of theories. I don't know what, what theory is true because I can't beat the game, but it really made me feel like this writer knows what they're doing. They know how to create a pulse, how to create callbacks without trying to impress people. Callbacks that are used to be useful rather than a dot. It's a callback. Do you see that? You know, 
The point of writing isn't to impress the audience, it's to tell the story as effectively as possible. And that's really what these techniques are being used for. But there is also an example where we see those techniques, a couple examples, where we see those techniques sabotaged. And that's where I was going with the marketing stuff. When you first get here, one of the conceits is that you're a small team that is coming here to research this planet and get off planet before a huge enemy frigate shows up uh, with antimatter lasers and shit because they're going to study the planet and you want to get off the planet before they arrive basic work right so you're like okay well how big is this crew that's coming along and your captain says oh they're the biggest they're their crew of a hundred men and you're like oh well that's a little bit of a flinch from the player because that's a hundred men men like specifically men and you're thinking to yourself okay well is that like me flinching at the writer using the term men or me flinching at the captain for using the term men and it turns out that Obviously, in the original book from 1965, men was probably the word used most often. Crew men rather than crew member. But the writer in the 2020 group, they understood that that was a flinch term. And they made that use of the flinch term specifically to wake you up to the fact that this is not a group of your compatriots. This is not 2023 scientists out on a magical mission. This is a group from another era, from another culture. And they're not coming at things in quite the same way that you would. And so that, you know, a little bit of a flinch moment just to make you aware of the fact that you should be a little uncomfortable here. This is not your home. This is their home. It was so subtly done and so well done. And there are a couple of other boom, 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 boom. Did you notice that this isn't where, this isn't 2023? Just little tidbits, little tidbits, little tidbits, little tidbits, a pulse reminding you that this is not where you are you this is where you are someone else the people you're inhabiting are not you and they're not the people from your world oh it was done so well so marvelously and then there's a five minute long speech about feminism while you're carrying a corpse and it's not tied into anything now the problem with this is I, I consider myself a feminist. I'm not offended by this feminist speech at all, but it doesn't fit. It was clearly put in because some marketing guy was like, oh, you got this little bit of a feminist thing going on here. I like that. Let's appeal to the demographic. You should just go in all the way. And the writer was like, uh, all, all the way? Yeah, just put in a speech about feminism. I, I guess. It doesn't fit into the game in the slightest. It actively sabotages the most important death in the game. The only other woman on the crew dies, and you're carrying her corpse up a cliff. She was your only, she was your biggest friend, uh, your only confidant on the ship. And the only thing you can do is get in a conversation about how nice it would have been if she could have led a whole bunch of women into their rightful roles as you know actually being able to be captains and shit and it's like yeah that would have been nice um uh, how does this relate to you emotionally because it could have been written to relate to you emotionally you could have written it such that it was clear that your character carrying her corpse up the cliff was struggling to come to terms with her death and was trying to compartmentalize or to adjust uh to try and maybe push through and get on with the mission even though she's gutted none of that it's literally just a speech about feminism and then you bung her into a giant rocket and send her back up to the ship it's such a disappointment because that time could have been used to actually make us feel like we feel something it could have let us connect to our character and the connection between her and the only other woman on the ship in this racist and sexist society but nope marketing gotcha let me give you an example of how it feels when it goes more right so we just got off of a, a moment where we helped three dudes over on the cliffs back there there were three dudes and we helped them they have severe brain damage two of them are damaged to the point where they're essentially animals and one of them is badly damaged so that he constantly forgets 
every day he just wakes up without any memory of what happened the previous days. So we got help for them. We got help from them, and we tried to set them up a little bit better. And now we drove over here. We're looking for their friends because they're not from our ship. They're from a different ship. And we're like, okay, well, we need to turn to this other ship, even though they're technically enemies. And look, there's their spacesuits. I'm reading their spacesuits. We get into the front of this vehicle. We don't see anybody. We hit the playback button on the radio, and it just starts playing back all the messages it's received. And it's just the guy we helped asking for help over and over and over. And for him, every single day is the same day. It's always March 26th, and it's always just been a couple of hours since people left. They need to come back. Guys, you didn't, you didn't go very far. Just come back and get us. Someone, come help us. Over and over and over and over and over. This is unfortunately very badly sabotaged by the fact that we learned about his memory loss before we came out here, but it's okay. It's still a very effective uh, bit. And finally, we managed to wrench the door open in the rear, which magically seals the front doors, so we have to walk out through the back, and it is, of course, a corpse boat. This is a funeral dirge. Everybody is dead. This is where they put the bodies. And it's a fairly effective sequence where you're walking through this field of corpses. And then you come out here. And at this point, you've used your sledgehammer for a while. As a writer, as an editor, you've created a scene that is a sledgehammer. Your goal is to bind that back into the player, into the characters, into the experience, so that you can change modes but still retain as much of that power as possible. <coughs> Sorry, I got a little sinus thing going on. So, um, how do they do that? Well, it's quite simple. When you come out here, the radio is still playing his pleas for help. And your commander is on the radio with you. And he's like, I, I can't talk anymore while this guy is begging for help in the background. Can you go shut that off? And you're like, I absolutely cannot shut that off, sir. Because that would require going back into that funeral boat. And he's like, oh. Okay, well, let's change channels then. And so you change channels with him. Small, right? Small. But precise. Bang, 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 bang. It was so well done. It just fold it right back in. That's the level of precision this writer is capable of. I do not believe that this writer would have written just a random ass monologue about how cool robots are if they were given the option of actually doing something useful because this game is full of random chatter about stuff that actively does not work within the framework of what this story is about uh, whether it's talking about feminism or talking about robots or talking about AI or just the fact that every 20 seconds there is a poke you're out here in the middle of nowhere in the desert, and every couple of seconds, your commander goes, How are you? You doing okay? Hey, you should move on. Let's go. Hey, 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 listen. Hey, listen, listen. Hey, hey, listen, listen. Hey, listen. Over and over and over and over and over. And I have a hard time believing the writer would have let that happen either because that is... That is actively destroying the feel of the game. But we got this really sharp dichotomy because the writer is capable of such shocking precision, winding things back into characterization, making sure the characters feel like who they are and feel competent and feel like they're moving through this plot at just the right speed. And then someone comes in and says, Oh, I gotta get a move on. Time's running out. No, you don't. Why? Why are you saying that? Because it's uh, the standard. Marketing guy says that that's what you should do. You always need to have the barks in there. There are so many elements of this game that shine. And you could easily watch a Let's Play of this game and actually miss them because they are so precise that if you're not at the helm, I'm not sure you'll see all of them. It's a little bit like Psychonauts 2. If you play Psychonauts 2, you'll have a fantastic time. If you watch someone play Psychonauts 2, 
you probably won't. And that's because of the difference between being at the controls and watching someone else be at the controls. And I think you'll have the same thing happen here. We can use these rhythmic techniques. We can use these patterns. The priority for me is to use them in ways that aren't there to go, ah, get it, get it, but are instead specifically to enhance the storytelling just quietly. And if no player ever notices, that's fine because they still get a more potent story out of it. But what really makes me notice this sort of setup is the fact that this second someone comes in and starts being off topic, it's gone. Your rhythm is completely ruined. It's like so many good things and then one line from marketing about appealing to a demographic and all of that rhythm is just thrown off. You need to have this really aggressive sticking to it because what seems to happen, at least for me, is that the writing takes on its own pace. Separate from my experience as wandering around on this moon, the writing does its own plane, its own time. So if I spend two hours walking around on the moon, that doesn't affect my, my, my uh, writing rhythm because it's a different part of the experience to me. I've compartmentalized it. That seems to be what happens to me, and I'm presuming it's what happens to a lot of people because a lot of people really loved at least the first few hours of this game. So I think that we can use these techniques, but in order to use them, we have to focus down. We have to make sure that our writing doesn't deviate from those rhythms. And that means things like branching paths are going to be poison. You're going to have to be super careful to wrap up your rhythm before a branching path hits and then start your rhythm up again on the far side of it. Uh, you're going to have to be careful about writing off-topic things just because marketing says you should or just because they're left over from an earlier draft because those off-topic things are going to screw up your writing rhythm. It's, it's one of those things where I think that if we're very precise, if we're very rigid about not letting off-topic things creep in, I think we can use these techniques. At least that's my opinion. Let me know what you think down below, and uh, see you around.